It's June 2017, and John Flannery, the newly announced CEO of GE, steps into a piece of history. A seemingly boring industrial building, but a building that housed the creation and development of one of the most monumental companies in the history of the United States. This was the exact location where GE was incorporated all the way back in 1892, and once bustled the full campus of manufacturing, production, and unstoppable growth but now stood eerily quiet in comparison. You see, behind closed doors, turmoil within the company was causing unprecedented change, including a gigantic reduction of employees and the general range of operation for GE. This turmoil was exactly what Flannery was visiting to address, but what he was about to overturn was more than he ever could have imagined. Now, Flannery had a background in accounting and knew his way around a financial statement, so that's exactly where he started. As he paged through the financial report, he immediately saw a problem. GE Power, its largest industrial business, was completely out of cash. There was almost no money coming in the doors, and on top of it, Power was building more inventory. This meant that they were essentially wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars by building incredibly expensive machines, all the while the market for those exact machines was drying up before their eyes. He later described it by saying, they drove off a cliff with no skid marks. They hadn't even hit the brakes before they plunged off into an abyss. But that's not even the worst of it. As he investigated further, he found an even bigger obstacle. Much of the reported profits that the division had recorded were aspirational, if not fraudulent. GE Power was making up numbers by borrowing from the company's future earnings and placing them in the present to cover up current problems. They sold service guarantees decades out and then decreased the future cost of that service so that it looked like the profits in the present were higher. Flannery made it clear to anyone in the room that he could not believe his eyes as he turned to the financial chief beside him and yelled, Did you fucking know about this? Probably didn't grab him like that, but you get the idea of where his head must have been in the moment. And the longer Flannery investigated the inner workings of the company, the more problems he stumbled upon and the more of an uphill battle he began to see. The company he was overtaking, once the most valuable company in the world at $600 billion, now stood worth 84% less. But all this begs the question, how did GE even get here? Money, machines, knowledge, vision, research. It is thrilling indeed to know that this is General Electric's contribution to the world of today and the better world of tomorrow. So to understand the full story, we actually have to go all the way back to a CEO that you probably know the name of, Jack Welch. And if you don't know who Jack Welch was, well, he was one of the most well-known leaders of the 20th century, gaining fame and appraisal from his years as CEO of General Electric from 1981 to 2001. And when Welch took over GE, well, it looked like your stereotypical American corporation. They produced appliances and light bulbs. They didn't really try to be anything else. And they were even managed the same way that other big corporations were managed. Classic bureaucratic system of splintering the company off into many, many product divisions and then just assigning managers to each one of those branches. When Welch came in, whew, that all changed. Jack Welch became known as Neutron Jack because it looked like a neutron bomb was dropped off onto the GE workforce. A neutron bomb takes people out but leaves the building standing. Welch came in and fired 80,000 people and GE's workforce was around 400,000 at the time. So he immediately took out almost 25% of the employees. And he made it known that he was done with that old style of management and was ready to trim fat in every single sector of the company. All these things from the military that we had learned and layers and bureaucrats and parking spaces, trimmings of office. Oh, horrible. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. The management wasn't the only thing he was done with, though. Welch was ready to transform the company and accelerate its growth through whatever means possible. He implemented a policy of firing the employees who fell into the bottom 10% of employee performance reviews. He outsourced labor to 
any cheaper countries that he could find. He created a GE Financial Services division. He bought RCA Corporation, which is the parent company of NBC. He even strongly fought against government orders to clean up the gallons of waste that GE dumped into the Hudson River a few years before. GE has left us with a river polluted, contaminated, and changed for generations. That one I don't blame him though. I mean, it would cost GE money that they could have used more efficiently. I mean, we can't be wasting good money on the environment. We've got capitalistic needs here for Jack Welch. Anyway, so what happened with all that growth-centered change, you might ask? Well, surprise, surprise, GE grew a lot. I mean, just look at their value from his time as CEO. That thing looks almost exponential there. And if there's one thing that investors love, it's almost exponential growth. So Welch became a celebrity. At shareholder meetings, the guy would often be asked to autograph the company's annual reports like a movie star. Can I have your, can I have your autograph, please? By the time he retired in 2001, the company had reached that $600 billion valuation. So with all eyes on GE, Welch transferred the reins to a man named Jeff Immelt. And on September 7th, 2001, Immelt stepped into the office, optimistic and ready to lead GE. But uh, let me repeat that date for you, September 7th, 2001. Yep. Four days before 9-11, Immelt became CEO of one of the world's leading jet engine manufacturers. He's quoted, my second day as chairman, a plane I lease, flying with engines I built, crashed into a building I insure, and it was covered on the network I own. And so the downfall of the most valuable company begins. The tax instantly flattened the airline industry and would take years to build back, so Immelt would immediately have a lot to take on. But how he chooses to handle this problem is not how you would expect and actually fairly fascinating, fairly telling to how GE would go down as a company. He ends up turning to the financial division that Welch created called GE Capital. By this point, it had ballooned to a huge percentage of GE's annual profit. Since early 2001, GE had been buying up massive amounts of real estate, spending billions per deal in every corner of the country. So as it turns out, sneaking their way into the world of commercial mortgages and rent collection paid off incredibly well with those assets now standing around 24 billion by the end of 2001. GE Capital was now the world's largest non-bank financial operation. But I just mentioned that this was the beginning of the downfall. I mean, that seems like a legitimate operation that shouldn't get them in trouble, right? Well, unfortunately not. Unfortunately, GE was also doing some pretty sketchy stuff in this period. For example, they would buy a real estate company with thousands of properties and appraise them all at a very low value. This meant that when they were sold, it looked like they were bringing in a huge profit. In actuality, that number was a lot lower. Or get this, this is even crazier. What about how they created and ran business entities separate from GE and used them to buy assets from General Electric at ridiculously high prices to make it look like they were pulling in more than they were. It's kind of ridiculous when you think about it. That's like selling yourself some old furniture, moving it across the room, and then going, all right, I made 500 bucks this weekend. And if GE had their way, well, these practices would remain hidden forever, but here we are talking about them. So what happened? Well, it was almost like a row of dominoes going now that looked something like this. The Enron scandal occurs, which leads to new laws that specifically outlaw suspicious accounting practices. Without these accounting practices, GE numbers slump, which leads to more scrutiny and investigation into General Electric. And that investigation eventually leads to the black box of GE profits being opened and peered into with criticism following shortly behind it. It's almost comical because as things got difficult, more and more problems began to show up out of nowhere as if they were just non-existent before and most likely they were hidden during that Welch era. Because of course, when things are good, nobody wants to question the practices in place because they don't want to stop that growth. So with the discovery of the accounting practices comes the discovery of their toxic workplace environment and culture as well. And as we peel back these massive company problems, well, Amelt 
seems to see them only as small speed bumps and continues to proclaim to investors that the company will see sustained organic growth in the future. But investors are a little smarter now after that whole Enron debacle. You know, they've seen these bigwig CEOs make empty promises before, and now they want some hard proof. And the way ML plans on bringing that hard proof is through, wait for it, real estate. Oh man, this guy cannot get a break, can he? I mean, now we look back at, in hindsight, you know, and we know what's right around the corner uh, from the early 2000s. But you know, at the time, they must have been thinking, hey, this real estate industry is booming. It's done well for us in the past. Let's put our money there. So anyway, GE Capital buys Wirehouse, Wirehouse Mortgage Company and the entire mortgage portfolio of New Zealand's Superbank. They buy huge percentages of commercial real estate and they let their reliance on this one sector bubble up just a little, little too much. Don't get me wrong, they had loads of investments in other areas, but nonetheless, being involved in real estate in any sense, of this size in 2006, 2007, 2008, that whole area, I mean, you can see where this is going. Good evening, and as you can see, we are originating the broadcast tonight from CNBC Global Headquarters, so we could come to the experts at our business channel as we begin our coverage tonight of what's been called the worst financial crisis in modern times. And there you go, another unfortunate event that Imbalt finds himself trying to clean up and this process essentially repeats itself over and over again. I mean, Amelt is dealt a fairly bad hand. He deals with it poorly, but then he acts overly optimistic with the future, basically begging his investors to buy more stock because the future of GE is bright. Just believe me, just ignore the numbers. Uh, but you know, like I said, GE investors, they're not really buying it until they see some hard proof and the stock price just remains stagnant here. Which brings us back to where we were in the beginning of the video with John Flannery. And like we talked about, when he takes over, he discovers a colossal mess that has been dropped onto his lap, a dumpster fire, if you will. And Flannery takes the bull by the horns. He starts tackling a lot of the mess that we've been talking about. And the message reverberates around the headquarters and really the entire company. There's no more success theater that we're gonna have we're not going to pretend that the ideas that we've been putting forward are working. We're not going to pretend that our broken software works. We're not going to be incredibly overly optimistic that gets to this point of where it's dangerous. No more infallibility. He was honest and realistic about how long it would take to recover, which was a while. But investors in the board didn't like that. They wanted something in the middle, I guess. Not overly optimistic like Emelt, but not ultra realistic like Flannery. I guess some sort of happy medium. So the brutal honesty tanks the stock price and he only serves for a little over a year. But his successor, Lawrence Culp, comes in and basically has the same approach as him. So GE investors and the board just have to accept this mess is going to take years to clean up and GE may never be the company that it once was again. Before you click away, I wanna thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. It would be amazing if you could like and share the video if you found it interesting. I mean, you're here all the way at the end, so seems like you did. You know, subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one. I plan on doing a bunch of company story type videos, so stick around and you can learn about how other companies have succeeded or failed or come from incredible heights like GE and, you know, crash down to the bottom. Um, so yeah, with that, thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.